Greetings, dear brothers and sisters, in the holy, mighty name of our Lord and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Once again to Messiah and Messiah alone be all the praise, honor and glory. And today is the 20th day, right Anna? Yes. Yeah, today is the 20th day of the second month, the year 2019. We are already in the 20th day today. Dear brothers and sisters, I'm here to help our nine-year-old daughter Anna. She has, the Lord wants us how to share, I believe, three extremely urgent visions once again and two urgent words pointing to Messiah's extremely, extremely imminent return, dear brothers and sisters. Messiah's return is upon us today among the visions, between the visions and the words. Once again, eight times Messiah is pointing us to the same fact that his return is imminent, it is upon us, is sounding the alarm, are we ready? So he, and two times he's telling us twice, he's telling, be ye ready between the words and visions, through the two words and three visions, twice, M Messiah is once again warning us that my return is upon you, I'm about to return, be ye ready. Those are the words which Messiah is telling us, dear brothers and sisters, when we read, I believe, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Verses 51 and 52. We all have heard it when Paul says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Dear brothers and sisters, that's the moment we are in. It can be any moment, it can be, it can be this evening, it can be tonight, it can be, it can be any moment, it can be tomorrow, it can be a week from now or a month from now. Hunting down on the time won't help us, dear brothers and sisters. When we read, when Paul is telling, behold, I tell you a mystery and we hear about the last trumpet. What do we, what is our first thought, dear brothers and sisters? Today, let's take a, take a look at it. With a newer set of eyes, let let the Spirit of God and God unfold with a newer set of eyes that what exactly Paul is trying to tell us here. Here, let's take a look at last trumpet, dear brothers and sisters. In the biblical language, the trumpet is called shofar. We all of us have heard it. We are waiting for that shofar of God to sound. The shofar, shofar was the most uniquely biblical instrument which is basically also called ram's horn it was the most uniquely placed biblical instrument it was the most unique biblical instrument god has used that for the israelites over and over again we know the importance of the trumpet through reading the book of psalms revisiting the the jewish hamoidims which are the seven hamoidims for their for their feasts the high feasts so the root word for shofar means clear. The root word for shofar, if we look up the Hebrew word, it means clear. A shofar must make a clear sound. A shofar must make a clear sound and be cleared through and through. Any obstruction and the sound will be hindered. We can blow through something that's clogged, right? Can we? Similarly, dear brothers and sisters, we are called to be a vessel, an instrument of Lord's purposes. We are to be the Lord's shofar that he blows through. In Hebrew, breath is called as ruach. Ruach also means spirit. I repeat, dear brothers and sisters, in Hebrew, breath is also called as ruach. Ruach also means spirit. The Spirit of God. So as the Lord's instrument, we must be free of obstructions. What can be those obstructions? Bitterness, apathy, selfishness, pride, lust, carnality, immor immorality, fear, and, and all those fleshly sinful desires. Anything outside of God's will, dear brothers and sisters, obstructs the blowing of His breath. The question is, dear brothers and sisters, in these end moments, in these end moments, are we here to bear fruit and glorify our Heavenly Father? 
Do you want God to be able to make a great sound through your life? In that case, then his breath, his spirit, his ruach must flow through you. We need to get those blockages out today, dear brothers and sisters. Today is the day to start clearing up our vessels. Today is the day anything out of God's will isn't only bad, it's stopping us from no from living and knowing God's will and living a spirit-filled life. As a matter of fact, 2 Timothy, I believe 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 21 says, If anyone cleanses himself from these things, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, and useful for the master. The Lord wants to use us, use you and me. It's time today, dear brothers and sisters, it's time to become a clear vessel. As we dwell more on what Paul tells us about the last trumpet, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. As we keep dwelling on that, behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. At the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. As we think about that, let's. Let us remember the most crucial thing that we are called to be God's trumpet, God's shofar. Why? So that his ruach, his spirit, his breath can flow through you and me. Dear brothers and sisters, all, all across the scriptures, God tells us, tells you and me to surrender our lives to him. This is no small task. This is no small task. All our plans, every desire we feel, each entitlement that once seemed our right. Everything is put aside in order to make way for our Messiah, for our reigning and coming King's will. But perhaps, perhaps we wonder at times that why did God ask this of us? If the Ruach, if the Shofar needs to be cleansed, then we need to completely surrender every single cells of our body to Him. But why so? Dear brothers and sisters, the Lord, Lord Jesus Christ has every right to demand that we give him our all. We give him our all and not our leftovers. He has every right. How? First, scripture teaches us that he is sovereign, the king and the ruler over the entire universe. As a result, we are under his authority, whether we choose to submit or not. Secondly, through Messiah's death and resurrection, Lord Jesus Christ saves us from our sin and its consequences. Therefore, we are indebted. We are indebted to him forevermore. And thirdly and finally, Messiah is the one who sustains us. We should consider each breath, each heartbeat, a gift from Messiah and Messiah alone. Dear brothers and sisters, undoubtedly, undoubtedly, God is entitled to ask that we yield our entire life to him. At the same time, dear brothers and sisters, Surrender is in our best interest. He is not a dictator. He is not trying to take over here and make it worse for us. It is surrender is in our best interest. Our Heavenly Father promises that following Him leads to hope and an established future. Psalm 31, 19, I believe states, Oh, how great is your goodness which you have laid up for those who fear you. Dear brothers and sisters, so while He is the Almighty One with all authority to demand our life, He promises, He promises to you and me to care for us and to do what will benefit us the most because we the truth is we don't know dear brothers and sisters but the question today is dear brothers and sisters are we willing to put ourselves our flesh aside in order to follow lord jesus christ his way is the best and it offers hope joy and peace out of several other things we will we perhaps we will not always like everything messiah chooses at the moment, but he promises that all things work for good. The question is today, will you trust God enough to hand the reins over to him? Today, will you? Today, dear brothers and sisters, and if so, today is Anna. Today is Anna shares Messiah's words and visions with us. And a message once again, which Anna has for us, solely led by the Spirit of God, Ruach HaKadish, explaining us once again how to keep Christ preeminent, how to surrender our lives, and why, how, what, motivates us to surrender our lives to him let us today once again 
set aside all our differences, set aside park our flesh, let us invite the presence of the Holy Spirit, let us set aside our situations and circumstances, let us ask the Lord to strengthen us, to renew our minds, let us invite the presence of the Holy Spirit to guide us through, and let us ask Messiah to decrease us, and transform our lives according to Messiah's mighty will during this time, and let us bow our hearts today, and let's Start with a word of prayer. Shall we, Emma? Yes. All right. Hallelujah. 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 We just praise you. We just praise you. We give you all the praise and honor and glory, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for one more glorious day, one more glorious message, one more reminder, Lord, that your return is upon us, that our faith is about to be sight, Lord, as we wait upon you. Please do help us, Lord, as in our flesh, we feel that impatience at times, Lord. Father, please do forgive us today, Lord. Help us, Lord, today to overcome our unbelief and believe you that your return is imminent. Help us, Lord, not to run for the tangibility of proof of your return. Help us, Lord, to take you at your word. Today, we once again together bring all our dear fellow brethren, every single dear brothers and sisters in your presence. We bring them, Lord, wherever they are, whatever their struggles are, however they are struggling to believe that your return is upon us. Lord, help them, Lord. You are the creator. You are the maker of the heaven and earth, the metacosm, the macrocosm, and the microcosm. Lord, you know everything. Lord, through us it is impossible, but through you, Lord, everything is possible today. We bring them, Lord, all their brokennesses, all their unbelief, all our unbelief, all the ways we are struggling, Lord. We bring it to you, Lord. We pray, Lord. Help us, Lord, so that only your mighty will be done, Lord. Help us, Lord, so that we can trust in you, Lord, the one who called each one of us. By thy grace and thy grace alone and not any merit of our own. We thank you, Lord, for the incredible, incredible, incredible extremes, Lord. You went on our behalf. So that we may have life and life in abundance. We thank you Lord. We bring all our dear fellow brethren. And ask you Father please if you would once again rekindle in each one of us. Give us a renewed appetite and a renewed hunger Lord for thee and thy word. For the word and word incarnate help us Lord today to fix our eyes on thee and thee alone Lord. And help us Lord today as we receive your message hear your message lord today help us lord to understand what you have to trust in you to believe you lord help us lord today once again lord help us to grow in your grace and knowledge lord father as we behold the horizon and sense the urgency of the perilous times lord we are living in we do seek discernment father that we might know that what it is you would have each one of us every single of our dear fellow brethren do for we do understand, Father, that opportunity is not mandated, that you have called each one of us, every single of our dear fellow brethren, you have called each one of us to a specific task to the Oh, Father, we pray that we pray that we pray. Lord, that if you would please, through your Ruach HaKodesh, through your Spirit, Lord, please make that evidently clear to each and every single of our dear fellow brethren, to each one of us, that in the days that remain, we might be each more. Fruitful stewards of the opportunities, Lord, you are presenting us with. Father, once again today I bring Anna and myself in your presence and pray, Lord, today as we convey your message, Lord, to your appointed people. Please, please, Lord, be our strength and our weaknesses, Lord. We anoint every alphabet, every thought, everything which will be spoken, Lord. Hold for your glory, whatever is not from you, Lord. Please let it not happen through us. It is impossible, Lord, through you. Everything is possible, as Matthew 19, 26 says today. We came on Psalm 141, verse 3, and pray, Father, that please, please do set a guard, Lord, over our mouths and keep watch over the door of our lips as we convey your message to your appointed people. And right this moment in the name of our coming and reigning King Yeshua HaMashiach. Using our authority of Luke 10, 19, we bind every evil of the enemy which is coming at this time, coming at this video, coming at our dear fellow brethren, every single of our dear brothers and sisters. And we pray, we pray for the hedge of protection for each one of us. Father, we pray that may this message once again reach to your appointed people, Lord, to accomplish thy mighty will. 
And also, Father, please do enlighten the hearts and minds of all our dear fellow brethren through your Holy Spirit and help them, Lord, to understand what you precisely have for them through this message. May this message once again, Lord, may your mighty will be done. May there be a transformation in each one of us, Lord. May there be a revival in our all those fleshly thoughts once again. Help us to surrender to your mighty will, Lord. As we surrender this time, we thank you, Father, once again, and we commit every single of our dear fellow brethren into thy mighty hands without any reservation whatsoever, Lord. In the name above every single name of Yeshua HaMashiach, your suffering servant, and our Redeemer, our Lord, our reigning and coming King, indeed, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Amen. And amen and amen. All right, you can please go ahead, Anna. So on the ninth day of the first month of this year, 2019, I heard the Lord say, My child, I am coming soon. This is not the time to give in to the deception of the enemy, for the enemy is indeed deceiving many. So be in my presence. Amen. And on the 17th day of the first month of this year, 2019, I heard the Lord say, My child, be in my presence. This is the time of my coming. There is no more time. Tell my people not to give in to the deception to the deception of the enemy. Tell them that my return is imminent. I am indeed coming soon. Shalom, my beloved children. And coming to the visions which the Lord wanted us to share, the first one was on the 11th day of the first month of this year, 2019, and I saw the words, Be ye ready, written in big red and yellow letters. Below it, I saw the words, Christ is coming, written in blue letters. The background was white. And that was the end of the vision. The second one was on the 13th day of the first month of this year, 2019. And I saw a background of a waterfall and a rainbow in the sky. On the background, I saw the words, Jesus is coming, written in letters of green, purple, yellow, orange, and pink. And at the bottom of the picture, I saw the words, for his bride and then soon and very soon written in blue letters and that was the end of the vision and the last one was on the 16th day of the first month of this year 2019 and i saw a picture of lord jesus christ standing wearing a multicolored robe at his upper left i saw the words be ye ready written in orange at the lower part of the picture i saw the words he is coming written in red and in the wide gap between the words, I saw Yeshua HaMashiach, written in purple Hebrew letters. And that was the end of the vision. So today we see that Lord Jesus Christ is reminding us that he is coming soon. And he is reminding us also of the importance to be aware of deception. He is once again pointing out the need to be in his presence and keep on trusting him. So we see that the antidote to being deceived is being in the presence of God. The only way we can avoid being misled by the deception of the enemy is choosing to follow the leading of God. If a sheep faces a struggle daily, a confusion between following the true shepherd or a thief, then the best thing to do is never to venture out of the shepherd's safekeeping and his leading. In the same way, if we today are struggling to avoid the deception of the enemy, then the way to avoid it is by remaining in the care of our good shepherd. Today the Lord is leading me to talk about Psalm 25. Psalm 25 is about following the leading of the Lord. Psalm 25 is a psalm of King David. It is an acrostic psalm and it has 22 verses. So verses 1 through 3 say, To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in you. Let me not be ashamed. Let not my enemies triumph over me. Indeed, let no one who waits on you be ashamed. Let those be ashamed who deal treacherously without cause. So here King David is asking that, as he trusts in God, for God to keep him from being put to shame. The Bible says that whoever believes on Christ will never be put to shame. So here King David is asking God to fulfill his word and not to let him be put to shame. King David is also showing us that he admits that it is not possible to be kept from shame anywhere else except in the presence of God. The question we need to ask ourselves today is, do we admit that also? Does our life show that we truly believe that only God can keep us from shame? 
Do we turn to God for joy at all times? Is he our satisfaction? These are questions we all need to ask ourselves. If we do indeed acknowledge that only God can keep us from shame, then we should spend our time in his presence and not be focused on ourselves. Verses 4 and 5 say, Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me, for you are the God of my salvation. On you I wait all the day. So here we see that King David is asking God to guide him and lead him. The words guide, teach, lead, and show appear nine times in this psalm. This psalm is about the importance of following the leading of our Good Shepherd. Today we rarely ask God to teach us his paths. And when we do, we forget to consider that in order to learn, we need to undergo certain trials and tests, as we see in Psalm 119.71. But in order to follow our Good Shepherd, we need to know his paths. It is not necessary to know the destination, but it is very crucial to know how to follow him. Lord Jesus Christ told us that following him requires three things. Luke chapter 9 verse 23 says, Then he said to them all, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. So to follow Christ, we must consider that he requires of us self-denial, which is something we rarely talk about today. Christ wants us to deny our flesh. We need to deny our flesh and walk in the spirit. It is a daily practice which doesn't happen in one day. It is a daily fight to say no to our flesh, to the things our flesh urges us to do. It is indeed a fight. Paul tells us about the battle between the flesh and the spirit in Romans chapter 8 verses 6 through 8 and Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 26 out of other places. It is not easy. Our flesh is our sinful nature. But if we are truly born again believers, then God says we are born of his spirit. Not that we won't struggle with our flesh, but we have the power to win the victory in the midst of the struggle. Because the spirit and the flesh are at two opposite ends with each other, as we see in Galatians chapter 5 verse 17. But the spirit who lives in us is greater than he who is living in the world, as we see in 1 John chapter 4 verse 4. But the question is, do we today have the desire to deny our flesh through the power of the Holy Spirit? Or do we enjoy being in our flesh and we desire to be there? These are questions we all need to ask ourselves. Because if we want to be in our flesh, we are quenching the Holy Spirit. Then he cannot work in us. We need to yield to the Spirit of God and then he can work in us. Because he doesn't force us to do something. He presents it before us. He presents the evil way and the good way and tells us what each leads to. And then he lets us choose. We can either quench him or listen to him. He always tells us in our hearts that it is always worth listening to him, but he doesn't force us to do things. He is willing to give us a chance if we will choose him. So basically the point is, it, that it is our choice to follow the Spirit of God. It doesn't automatically happen and He won't push us. We need to make that first choice and allow God to do the rest. Coming back to Psalm 25, let us move on to verses 6 and 7. King David says, Remember, O Lord, your tender mercies and your loving kindnesses, for they are from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth, nor my transgressions. According to your mercy, remember me for your goodness' sake, O Lord. So here we see that in these two verses, the word remember appears three times. The Hebrew word for remember is zachar. It is one of the two Hebrew words which make up the word zechariah, which means God remembers or remembered by God. So here we see that King David is asking God to remember his tender mercies, which have been there from eternity and will be for eternity. Not that God had forgotten them or had ceased to be merciful. King David is simply asking that God would continue to be merciful to him. It is not a prayer for God to resume his mercy, but to continue his mercy. Because if it is not for God's mercy, none of us could be alive. 
But we will only understand that when we understand that everything, every good thing we receive from God is undeserved. But we often tend to get used to receiving good things from God and slowly we begin to think we deserve it and that God has to give us what we, what we need. But King David understood that deliverance was not what he deserved, nor forgiveness, nor hope, nor help. That is why he is asking God for mercy first and then the rest of the things. To King David, being right with God was first priority when it came to prayer. We today, however, seem to have as first priority when we pray to make sure God has given us all the good things. We go and complain about our troubles. We tend to expect that we need better things because we refuse to accept that we are sinful, we are unholy. We refuse to accept that. But today is the day for us to accept our sinfulness and thus choose to request God for his mercy and for his empowering to live a life which pleases him and does not delight to live in sin. Next, King David asks God not to remember the sins of his youth. King David is basically asking God not to remember his past sins. It does not necessarily mean the sins of when he was a boy, but his past sins. For God not to remember the sins of his youth doesn't mean that God will literally forget them. It means he will forgive King David for them and not keep account of all the mistakes in order to punish him for them. And last, King David asks God to remember him according to the mercy of the Lord and for his goodness's sake. We all sometimes feel like God has forsaken us, but God promised that he will never leave us nor forsake us. That's what Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5 tells us. We may sometimes feel like God has forgotten us, but the truth is that whatever the enemy may tell us, God will never leave us nor forsake us, and he has not forgotten us. King David is not saying that God has forgotten him and thus is asking to be remembered. Rather, King David is asking God that as he has always remembered King David, to always remember him to the end. Let us move on to verses 8 and 8 through 10. King David says, Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore, he teaches sinners in the way. The humble he guides in justice, and the humble he teaches his way. All the paths of the Lord are mercy and truth to such as keep his covenant and his testimonies. So here we see that King David is saying that God will teach his people his way. But at the same time, King David is saying that God expects a few things of us. We are not talking about works-based salvation here. We are talking about living lives that glorify God as a response to his grace and love. So this psalm is first telling us that God expects of us humility. Let us not forget the humility and meekness which our Savior demonstrated when he was on earth. Let us never forget to consider how meek he was. Lord Jesus Christ humbled himself to the lowest point anyone can humble oneself. And that is why he is now exalted the, to the highest. And he said that he has set the example for us. That is what John chapter 13 verse 15 tells us. That means that he expects us to follow him and be like him in all we do. And that is not something we can do. That is why God has given us his Holy Spirit to indwell in us and to make us more and more like Christ as we yield to him. And that is what the sanctification ministry of the Holy Spirit is all about. The next thing Psalm chapter 25 verse 10 is telling us, which God expects of us, is that he wants us to keep his covenant and his testimonies. We know that now we are under the new covenant which Christ brought about for us by his death and resurrection. But that new covenant does not leave us without any responsibility. Our responsibility is to live a life that glorifies God by yielding to his Holy Spirit as he produces the fruit in us. That's what John chapter 15 verse 8 tells us. So what are the testimonies of God? The testimonies perhaps refers to the things which testify to us about God here in Psalm 25. If this is so, then all creation and even the cross are testimonies of God. Let us not get this confused with pantheism. To be pantheistic means to find God in everything, to see everything as a sign from him. And God does indeed use many things to tell us about himself, but that doesn't mean we can find him in everything. Let us also be careful of falling into the trap of polytheism. To be polytheistic
mystic means to have many gods. The creation of God as a whole and even everything in it individually perhaps are his testimonies, but that doesn't mean we should worship the sun, moon, stars, sky, or anything. They are indeed wonderful demonstrations of God's greatness, but they are not God. Romans chapter 1 verses 18 to 32 describes what happens when we worship the creature instead of the creator. But the point is God's testimonies are perhaps refers to the things which testify to us about him. Thus, not only, not only the creation, but also the word of God and even the cross can be called his testimonies. So what does it mean to keep God's testimonies? Anything which is a testimony of God must convey the Lord to us as the scripture conveys him to us, for the scripture is the only truth. So basically that means that every testimony of God will point out that God has loved us so much, so he gave us his good blessings which we do not deserve. Therefore, we must live lives that glorify God and not ourselves. So basically, to keep the testimonies of God means to stand in all of God and thus live a life that pleases God and not self. That is what Psalm chapter 25 verses 9 through 10 is telling us. Let us move on with Psalm 25. Verse 11 says, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. So in this verse, King David is doing three things. First, he is acknowledging that he does not deserve forgiveness. King David is therefore asking that the Lord will forgive him for his name's sake. In Psalm 23, King David had declared that God, as his shepherd, leads him in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. So we understand that as our good shepherd, the Lord forgives and erases our sins so we can once again walk in his paths of righteousness, all for his own name's sake. The second thing King David is doing in verse 11 of Psalm 25 is that King David is asking for the pardoning of his iniquity. Today we use the word pardon very lightly. We say pardon me when we bump into someone, like we say excuse me. But pardon has a greater significance. Pardon is forgiveness. To be pardoned means to be forgiven. But in order to be pardoned, one must be guilty. It is like a scene of a guilty sinner in front of the judge, who is pardoned by the judge and set free. Thus the word pardon is synonymous with the words forgiveness, acquittal, mercy, and compassion, besides the rest. The righteous judge, the judge of the whole earth, as the Bible says, who cannot tolerate unpunished sin, pardoned us who were guilty sinners, and yet kept justice by laying the penalty on his son. That is what pardon is. Pardon is undeserved by all who receive it. It is an undeserved gift of God, which he offers to everyone who receives it, as well as those who don't. He knows who will accept it, as well as who will reject it. But he still offers it to everyone. And the next point, which we see in Psalm chapter 25, verse 11, explains to us what is the first step of receiving that pardon. So the third point is basically that King David acknowledged the greatness of his sin. King David is saying, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my iniquity, for it is great. So here we see that King David is acknowledging how great his sin is. Only when we acknowledge how great our sin is, we will be able to ask God for his pardon. God is ready to give us his gift. But we cannot receive it unless we know how much we need it. A person who is in need of a gift must receive the gift in order to save, to solve that problem of need. If he is offered a gift by his friend to resolve that problem, he ought to receive it. The gift is at his doorstep, but he needs to be ready to accept the fact that he needs it before he can accept it. The gift may be right there, but the person in need, it is the person in need who needs to receive it. If he doesn't receive it, he cannot receive the solution to his problem. In the same way, we all are in desperate need of pardon and forgiveness, which is an undeserved gift of God, which he gives us as he pleases. But unless we receive that gift, then our need remain, remains a need. It is not yet answered. 
and unless we acknowledge our need for that gift, we cannot receive it. We need to look at how needy we are of God's pardon, and then we can receive it. And that is the point in Psalm chapter 25, verse 11. Let us move on with Psalm 25. Verses 12 through 15 say, Who is the man that fears the Lord? Him shall he teach in the way he chooses. He himself shall dwell in prosperity, and his descendants shall inherit the earth. The secret of the Lord is with those who fear him, and he will show them his covenant. My eyes are ever toward the Lord, for he shall pluck my feet out of the net. So here we see that King David is talking about how he has set his eyes on God, because only God could set him free. The imagery of a net is like a bird trapped in a net. Of course, a bird usually stands for Satan in the scripture, but here it refers to the people of God. It is an imagery to describe eternal deliverance. We cannot find deliverance anywhere but in God. It is nowhere else, and King David understood that. But while it is not in us to deliver ourselves, we do have a responsibility to set our eyes on Lord Jesus Christ. In Matthew chapter 14, we see how Lord Jesus Christ was walking on water, and then the disciples saw him and were afraid, thinking he was a ghost. And Jesus said, It is I. And then Peter said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And he said, Come. So Peter began to walk on water towards Lord Jesus Christ, and Peter could do it because Lord Jesus Christ enabled him to. Peter never imagined that he could walk on water. But when he witnessed the power of his Lord, he understood that through the same power it was possible for him too. Peter started well. He asked Jesus to give the command to step out into the water. Peter wanted to step out into the water, but he waited for Lord Jesus Christ to give the command. He waited for Lord Jesus Christ's permission. Peter began walking on the water towards Jesus, and as long as his eyes were on Lord Jesus Christ, he was fine. But then he took his eyes off of Lord Jesus Christ, and then looking at the water, he let doubt weaken that faith, and he began to sink. But what he did next was a step in the right direction. He turned his eyes back to Jesus and cried out for his help. Peter then tried to swim or find his way back to the boat. He turned to Jesus for deliverance. And that is where we are brought back to the point of Psalm 25. When we need deliverance, we ought to turn to our Lord to find it. We often enter into storms and then we take our eyes off of Lord Jesus Christ and we begin to drift away from him. But the moment we realize that, we should refocus our attention on Lord Jesus Christ and not seek to get back to the boat. Because we cannot do it with our strength. The only real solution is to turn to Lord Jesus Christ. And as we are running out of time today, let us real quick go through the last seven verses of Psalm 25. Verses 16 through 22 say, Turn yourself to me and have mercy on me, for I am desolate and afflicted. The troubles of my heart have enlarged. Bring me out of my distresses. Look on my affliction and my pain, and forgive all my sins. Consider my enemies, for they are many, and they hate me with cruel hatred. Keep my soul and deliver me. Let me not be ashamed, for I put my trust in you. Let integrity and uprightness preserve me, for I will wait for you. Redeem Israel, O God, out of all their troubles. So in these verses, King David is asking God to deliver him. Today is the day for each and every one of us to remember that we do not have the power to help ourselves. But that doesn't mean that we are weak and helpless ultimately. We have a good shepherd and we need to follow him. In him we are strong because he makes us strong. So let us today follow our good shepherd. And before we end today, here are a few questions to examine ourselves. Number one, what is the only way to avoid deception? Why is that the only way? Number two, what is Psalm 25 about? How does it show us that repentance plays a part in following the leading of our Good Shepherd? Number three, what does Psalm 25 teach us about pardon, forgiveness, 
mercy, and setting our eyes on Lord Jesus Christ. How can, number two, number four, how can we today apply the various but valuable lessons of Psalm 25 to our lives? How can you personally? Number five, what is following Christ? How can we follow him today? How can you personally? Jesus Christ is coming very soon. Let us be in his presence and trust in him. And today, let us fight the good fight, keep up the faith, and finish this race strong. Thank you, everybody, for viewing us, and may Lord Jesus Christ bless you all in abundance. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Once again, thank you so much, Anna, for reminding us that it is so very crucial to be in his presence. And brothers and sisters, the part of the problem is the longer we stay in this fallen world with our fallen nature, the magnitude of this fallenness we don't understand because we start assuming things, we start getting into things which we should not be, we start taking responsibilities of things which we should not be, which God did not intend for us to. The battle today is flesh versus spirit. We don't under, we will never understand the real battle of grace versus law unless we get to the flesh versus spirit battle. Dear brothers and sisters, only when we understand, only when we understand the fundamental problem is that every single day when we wake up, since morning till night, every single day till we get to bed, till we close our eyes, the battle is on flesh versus spirit. Our flesh, every single moment, it wants to steer us and gratify our flesh and they will be we can use scriptures as a matter of fact to justify our flesh there are so many ways that is why Anna was sharing with us today Luke 9 23 denying our flesh self-denial which we don't talk about much that self-denial is not in our self strength that battle is once again going to flesh versus spirit God has saved us from something, from our filth, from our sins, soaked in sins. But God has also redeemed us from that. But he has saved us unto, unto something. He has a purpose. He has a schedule laid out for us. So today, as a matter of fact, without getting into wasting further time, today real quick, try to understand and brief the battle between flesh and spirit which covers, as a matter of fact, the battle between grace versus law, which is an age-old, age-old battle which is going on. But the most crucial, the fundamental battle is flesh versus spirit. If we understand that, we will truly understand grace versus law. We don't even have to bother to defend that. We will totally understand that when we see, view from the lens of flesh versus spirit. As a matter of fact, today let's real quick jump into Galatians. We... Galatians chapter 5, we'll probably do about 10 verses, 5, Galatians chapter 5, verses 16, verses 16 through 25. Let's pick it up around 16 and hopefully we'll have enough time till 25. Verses 16 through 25, Galatians chapter 5. Dear brothers and sisters, we often have used the book of Galatians. It's, a, it's an astonishing book. We often have used the book to defend our liberty in Christ and that's what this book is about but there is more to it what exactly is this liberty in Christ it's not the book of Galatians Paul is telling us that yes it is not about law keeping it cannot be about law, law keeping definitely because in book of Ephesians we see that we were dead in our trespasses so it is the precious blood of Jesus Christ of Nazareth which saves us but there is more to it we need to study that book we need to Study that book to really understand book of Galatians 6 chapters. It's an astonishing, astonishing book. Dear brothers and sisters, if the Lord leads you, please, please do pray over. The first two chapters are basically very personal, which talks about, Paul talks about his ministry, his method and message. Well, chapters 3 and 4 are the doctrinal chapters. Chapters 5 and 6 is all, is the practical aspect. So Galatians chapter 1 basically talks about liberation through the gospel. The key word in the first two chapters, as a matter of fact, dear brothers and sisters, in the, book, in the book of Galatians is gospel. It is found 10 times. Verse chapters 1 and 2, I believe, has about, has about 45 verses. And it, the word gospel is repeated 10 times in the first two chapters. 
So first two chapters of book of Galatians, it is talking about the authenticity of our gospel. Galatians 1 is telling us that it is the gospel is genuine to its origin. And Galatians chapter 2 is telling it is genuine to its nature. And then Galatians chapter 3 and 4 defends the superiority of the gospel. So Galatians 1 and 2 is about the authenticity of the gospel. Galatians 3 and 4 is about the superiority of the gospel. And Galatians 5 and 6 is about the true liberty of the gospel. I repeat, Galatians 1 and 2 is about the authenticity of the gospel. Galatians 3 and 4 is about the superiority of the gospel. And Galatians 5 and 6 is about the true liberty of the gospel. And Galatians 3, we see the new relation it's, and its effects. Galatians chapter 4, we see the privileges. It re releases the gospel. And in Galatians chapter 5, the first 15 verses is basically love. Love service ends the law bondage. And from verse 16 onwards, today we'll pick it up around verse 16, Galatians chapter 5, of course. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16 onwards, till the end of the book, Galatians chapter 6, verse 18. It's the spirit ends the flesh bondage. It's so very crucial, dear brothers and sisters, to understand law versus grace. This battle is still following and we are still getting into when we study the book of Galatians, when we study the book of Romans, it should put an end to this battle and we should be yielding more to the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit. Chapters 3 and 4, book of Galatians, is about law versus grace. Chapters 3 and 4 is the doctrinal section and then Paul explains the relationship between law and grace. Three words are repeated very frequently here in chapters 3 and 4. Faith well, Faith is repeated 14 times, law is repeated 19 times, and promise 11 times. So Paul basically presents six arguments, six arguments about the law versus grace. That Paul presents six arguments, three in each chapter, chapters 3, chapter 3, and chapter 4. Three in each chapter, Paul is presenting six arguments seeking to prove that salvation is by grace, through faith, apart from the works of the Lord, dear brothers and sisters. Book of Romans is an astonishing, astonishing book. Book of Romans is the best doctrinal to understand about salvation, best doctrinal book ever written. After that, Book of Ephesians also supplements to the Book of Romans. And if we really understand, want to understand once again more about the battle between law and grace, chapters 3 and 4 of Book of Galatians. Is the doctrinal section where Paul is presenting six arguments. The personal argument, Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. The second is the scriptural argument, which is Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 through 14. And then the logical argument, Galatians chapter 3, verses 15 through 29. That's the argument to prove once again that salvation is by grace through faith apart from the works of the law. And... Galatians chapter 4, he has three arguments as the dispensational argument. Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. Then he has the sentimental argument in Galatians chapter 4, verses 12 through 18. And then he has the allegorical argument, which is verses 19 through 10, 31. So this is in brief the outline of the book of Galatians, dear brothers and sisters. Hopefully this will help each one of us. To take it to a prayer closet, please do take it to your prayer closet so that the Lord leads you to Pray over if the Lord leads you to dwell on the book of Galatians. It's an astonishing study once again. Just doing a study guided by the author himself, dear brothers and sisters, is what we need in these end moments. So Galatians 5, jumping before jumping in Galatians chapter 5 and 6, once again, there are four things going on. It's basically the first 15 verses talking about liberty and not bondage. Galatians chapter 5 verses 1 through 15. Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 26, which hopefully we'll be able to see today, is talking about the spirit versus flesh. And then Galatians chapter 6 basically talks about the others and not self, and then talks about God's glory and not man's approval. So let's jump in Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 through 25. We'll do as a matter of fact, not 26. So if you have, if you could please open your Bibles, whatever. Once again, let's not give in to the division of which version and all those things, dear brothers and sisters. We'll be using a New King James version. Let this Ruach HaKodesh, let the Spirit of God talk to us so that this is just not a written word, but it is 
it becomes an active and living word so that it can transform us rather than intellectually stimulating us. It can transform our minds, transform our lives so that we can move slowly to that Christ likeness for which we are saved. Romans 8 29 out of other places tells us so. Jumping in Galatians chapter 5, as a matter of fact, the word flesh and spirit, I believe, are each found 10 times in chapters 6 and 6, 5 and 6, excuse me. In chapters 5 and 6, the word flesh and word spirit, each of them are found 10 times. So walking, let's look at this battle, the flesh versus spirit. Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 through 25. So Paul says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. It can't be any clearer, dear brothers and sisters. Paul says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So walk in the spirit is not an option. If we understand Romans chapter 8 verses 5 through 8, we understand that walking in the flesh, we are displeasing God. And I'm sure, dear brothers and sisters, we can universally agree to that, that we are all here to please God. And glorify our Heavenly Father, not through our works or through our strength, but by yielding to the Ruach HaKodesh, the sanctification ministry of the indwelling Holy Spirit for what God has planned for you and me. So Paul says here, so walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So that's the key to start with. That's the key. The verb here in Greek is peripetet, peripetet or peripetite. It's basically a present imperative active. It's telling keep on walking. As a believer walks through his life, as a true born again believer, he should keep on depending on the indwelling Holy Spirit for guidance and power. But the Spirit does not, as Anna was trying to explain to us the same thing, that the Spirit does not operate automatically in a believer's heart. He waits to be depended on. There is no mention, dear brothers and sisters, in the scriptures of the sanctification of the old nature. The Bible rather says that the old has passed away, the new has come. The question is, does that new nature in me, does it show up? Once again, dear brothers and sisters, while no believer will ever be entirely free in this life from the evil desires that stem from our fallen human nature. Well, no believer, no believer will be entirely free. It's never about perfection. It's talking about the direction. But the true born again believer, he need not succumb and surrender to them. We don't have to succumb and surrender to all those fleshly temptations because we have, we can experience victory by the power of the indwelling Holy Spirit every time, every time, every time. When a true born again believer does yield to the Spirit's control, the promise that promises that he will not in any wise gratify the desires of the sinful nature. So the question is, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Dear brothers and sisters, it's always an either or. Either or. It's on this side or that side. Either we are in the flesh or in the Spirit. There are no middle ground. Either we are righteousness of, either we are slaves Either we are in the slaves of righteousness or we are slaves of sin. And these are all happening through the power of the Spirit of God whenever we are slaves of righteousness. So it is always it's the flesh versus the Spirit, dear brothers and sisters. There is nothing good. There can be nothing good in any one of us. So there is no question of our works, doing our works, pleasing God and obtaining salvation. It's, it's a blasphemy to say that because... It has been our every, our salvation has been settled on the cross of Calvary single-handedly by Lord Jesus Christ and Lord Jesus Christ alone. There is nothing, nothing trying to add anything to that is blasphemy. But then after that, what happens? After that, the command is to walk in the spirit because if we are walking in the flesh, we are enemies of God. We are displeasing God. Romans chapter 8 verses 5 through 8 is our authority. Please do check it out, dear brothers and sisters. Please don't, you don't have to believe us. We are not trying to sell our views, dear brothers and sisters. Please check it out. Let us be active. Be real like Acts 17, 11. Let us check it out and see if we are walking in our flesh. We are enemies of God. We are displeasing God as well as we are enemies. So how to avoid that? Paul says, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. 
and he does not stop there. He continues. Verse 17 says, For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. Dear brothers and sisters, these are key scriptures to understand. That's something we are talking about. Grace versus law. Grace versus law. Works-based salvation. Legalism versus grace. But why are we not talking about flesh versus spirit? Because when we talk about flesh, we feel condemned. That's not, con that's not condemnation from God. That's a conviction from God. God is working in you. God is telling you, my child, you don't have to do that. I know that you're struggling in your flesh, but I have won the victory. Come to me. And when you come to me and surrender to me, I will empower you, dear brothers and sisters. The scriptures are very clear all over. And this is just not a head knowledge. We are sharing experientially, dear brothers and sisters, that our God is so powerful, so powerful, so magnificent, so magnanimous. That no matter where you are today, no matter what the fleshly struggle is today, are you willing to surrender it to him? Dear brothers and sisters, when we play games with him, he knows what the intents of our hearts are. He knows what the, what the intents of our heart. That's the question whether we truly want to surrender whatever that fleshly thing is. Because if we want to please God, which should be the case if we are truly born again, because a truly regenerate heart does not have the desires of a non-regenerate heart of all the materialistic blessings. Those are not how it is. That cannot be. Scripture doesn't say that's what it is, dear brothers and sisters. Once again, these are very hard things to talk about because these are things which we don't like to hear. But dear brothers and sisters, that's what the Lord is putting on our heart to talk about. And if God is convicting you today, once again, dear brothers and sisters, come to him. Thank God that today he is talking to you. Hearing motivational speeches and finally understanding that it is not worth it. How does it help you and me? How does it help us? We need scriptural truths, not motivational speeches. We are living in deceptive times. We are living in times where we, the secular world is fulfilling the biblical, the, the biblical prophecies every single day. The perilous times we are living in. But at the same time, there is apostasy. There is deception in the body, the church. If we see the church history for the last 2,000 years, we see that the church has been injured more from inside than from outside, dear brothers and sisters. That's what we need to understand. Revelation, book of Revelation, chapters 2 and 3. As a matter of fact, when we see the book of Revelation opening, unfolding, when Lord Jesus Christ is talking to John, we see that the book of Revelation at the end, it gives us the time frame. is the past, the present, and the future tense. The Revelation chapter 1 is the past tense, 2 and 3 is the present tense, the time we are living in, and 4 through 22, 4 through 22 is the future tense. 2 and 3 is the time we are living in, the seven churches, the seven letters, what does Messiah say about the churches? What do we see there? There are still four churches which in our times it's active. We see Thyatira is active as the book of Revelation tells us. We see Sardis is active, which are the... Which are the denominational churches? We see then the Philadelphia churches, the missionary churches, and and then we see the Laodicea, the modern day churches, the apostate churches. So out of the four churches, if we see only one church, only one church had the promise to escape tribulation. That's twenty five percent, dear brothers and sisters. That's twenty five percent. It's so highly unfortunate. Today is the day to pay heed. If God is talking to our hearts, today is the day to pay heed. Today is the day to come to him and understand that for the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. Lord, here this is what I'm hearing from this video that the, my flesh is lusting against the spirit and spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another as your word is telling and it Paul goes on to say, so that you do not do the things that you wish. So Lord, how can I hear I come today every single day? Why don't we make it a habit? Lord, how can I please you today? How can I be more pleasing? Father, teach me to be more pleasing. The Holy Spirit will lead us, dear brothers and sisters, but we need to yield. We need to yield. 
Sometimes we won't like it. Sometimes it will be hard. Because there are hard lessons sometimes. It's the same way how it works, dear brothers and sisters, for our children. Sometimes it, they may not understand, they may not like, but our father knows the best. That's why he is doing for us. Each Christian has two natures. A sinful nature received at birth, a genetic defect inherited from fallen Adam, and a new nature received at regeneration, as Peter tells us in 2 Peter verses 1, 3 through 4, where he talks about the particles of divine nature, basically. So both natures, both natures have desires, the one for evil, the foreign one for evil, and are regenerate for the other one for holiness. And they are in conflict with each other. And the result can be that they keep a believer from doing what he otherwise would. That's what the last phrase in verse 17 does not teach, that the believer cannot get victory. It's so that you do not do the things that you wish. It, it is not meaning that the believer cannot get victory. The phrase, as a matter of fact, should be translated so that you may not do what you would. A mere determination, dear brothers and sisters, on the part of true born-again believer will never control this battle, will never control the flesh or produce the fruit of the Spirit. We know about how many New Year resolutions or how many different kinds of resolutions we have made. How long does it stay? A mere determination on a believer's part will never, is never going to do it. It's never going to control the flesh or produce the fruit of the spirit. And as a matter of fact, Paul amp amplifies this theme in Romans chapter 7 where he shows that the believer's determined attempts to please God in his own strength are destined to fail. Romans chapter 7, dear brothers and sisters, Romans chapter 7 is an astonishing chapter if you really want to understand. That's the law school which talks about how uh, whatever we do in our flesh is going to fail. So if the Lord leads you, please pray over. That's an astonishing chapter once again. Continuing to verse 18. So Paul says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. That's the key verse which we should probably take a printout, write on an index card and put it everywhere. It should put an end to all the debate about law and grace. I, let me repeat that. Paul says that's not something which is we, our conjecture or speculation or our theory or we are formulating this. This is the word of God. Inerrant, infallible word of God. Which is the absolute truth. Paul says, but if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. So the question is today, I need to examine myself whether I am being led by the Spirit or am I in am I being acting in my flesh? And dear brothers and sisters, once again, we are Paul is not talking about perfection. We are not talking about perfection. We are talking about direction. A regenerate heart has desires to please God every single day. It's not a question of we will fail. We will fail occasionally. We will fall definitely. But he will empower us. God is not here to see that every single day whether we are living a perfect life. No, he is not. He is seeing the intents of our heart. He knows the weakness of our flesh. That's why he came down to die. But he also understands our wickedness. He creates everything in six days. He tells everything. Bow down. Every, every creation bows down. But when he comes to man, he says, bow down. I am your God. I say, no, I won't. Because my brother is chip. You have not created me. And once again, dear brothers and sisters, that sounds, I'm being facetious, but that's the truth today. So highly unfortunate. How wicked we are. How wicked and how fallen humans are. When we, it needs to be surrendered, we need to submit. We need all the blessings. But when God wants us to surrender and submit, I say, no, I won't. I want my way done. I will use any scriptures for that because delight in the Lord and you will give me the desires of my heart. So why are you not giving me? Dear brothers and sisters, that's so highly unfortunate. That's Those are the times we are living in. Those are the unfortunate times we are living in. We approach God not to glorify Him. We approach God with some form of 
fleshly need or the others to be so that he can keep us happy. God needs to win us over every single day. God needs to win us every single day. He needs to please us every single day. Isn't that what we are seeing, dear brothers and sisters? And that's where we come back to what Paul says. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. And if we are doing those things, we are walking in the flesh. Now where does this grace and law battle, where does it go? And that's not it. This, is, this verse is validated by second, by Tim, uh, excuse me, by Titus chapter 2 verses 11 and 12. Where it says that the grace of God has appeared to all men. Teaching what? Teaching us how to lead a godly life. How to deny ungodly life and worldly lusts. Titus chapter 2 verses 11 and 12 dear brothers and sisters. So highly unfortunate we don't approach God. And dear brothers and sisters please don't get us wrong. We don't. It's not that we don't go and petition for our needs. But Messiah told us. That gave us this day our daily bread. In our Lord's prayer Messiah told us that we should. But. There is more to it. There is more to it. We talk to him heart to heart as a person. We talk to him. We open up. He is our best friend. We talk to him. We just don't get all whatever our needs. Whatever our fleshly things. We just don't gratify our flesh. And then. And that's it. Then we have really not understood. The attributes of our holy God. Somewhere something. Is lacking because we are not diligently digging deeper in the word to understand the attributes of Messiah. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the Lord, dear brothers and sisters. Today is the day to examine ourselves. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 13, 5 to examine our faith. Dear brothers and sisters, so many distractions, so many deceptions, perilous times, demonic times we are living in. We see in the secular world how things are, how God is being mocked. How we see there is all these gender changes. Now we need to have a new Bible that God created not Adam and Eve. God created Adam and Steve. And that's where the time we are living in. So highly unfortunate. This is the time. This is the time. As we sing these are the days of Elijah. This is the time to be the Elijahs of the day. This is the time for our light to so shine. So shine. So shine. That when our heavenly father looks down upon us. The one who gave it all. The one who gave his only begotten son to butchery. He was literally slaughtered for you and me. When he looks down upon us. That our heavenly father is well pleased with us. To be the salt of the earth. To be the light of the world. Because Messiah is the light of the world. And we are his reflected glory. Today is the day not to run after, run after fulfilling our needs only. Today is the day. Lord, help me to be the light of this world which you have called me to. Whatever it needs, whatever it takes, Lord. If you need to strip me of everything, all my thoughts, all my flesh, everything, so be it, Lord. Here I am. Crush me, Lord. But let my light so shine. So shine, so shine, that my heavenly father, who without a shadow of doubt, without a second thought, slaughtered, gave his only begotten son to butchery, who was slaughtered, mocked, spat upon. Can you imagine, dear brothers and sisters, our heavenly father, has a father looking down upon his son? Puny man specks of, the speck of dust there. Spinning, we are spinning upon his only begotten son. Why? Why did he? That's his love. That's his love for you and me. Where do we stand today? It's not a question about re repaying. It's a question about love. Loving him with all our heart, with all our mind, with all our strength, with all our soul. That only happens when we walk in the spirit. It doesn't happen. Love is a fruit of the spirit. And that's what we will be reading. Love is a fruit of the spirit. It's not. It's nothing. That's a gap in the word is. All love is all shallow love. It's all based on conditions. It's here today. Tomorrow is not there. And that's the truth dear brothers and sisters. 
And then Paul explains now. Here he is talking about the flesh versus spirit. Once again, we are talking about that's the real battle. If we understand that, we understood grace versus law. So here, if we understand, but verse 18, Galatians 5 verse 18. But if you're led by the spirit, you're not under the law. So if we are not led by the spirit, what does it mean? We are under the law. Your brothers and sisters, please, please do your own study. Please come to your own conclusions guided by the author himself, not by this channel, not by me and or David or anybody. Let the teacher, the author himself teach you. And Paul continues now telling, now the works of the flesh are evident. Now he'll talk in the next three verses, the works of the flesh. There are 17 things I believe he will be listing for us. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and dear brothers and sisters, it's it's going to be very helpful if, if you have a biblical dictionary to look up on these words, what it means, and where exactly we stand with it in the fleshly things. And dear brothers and sisters, once again, it's not about how perfect we are. If there is anything which is in the list, we pray God takes care of it. He will. It's we, he is able to keep what we commit to him until that day. If that doesn't, I don't have to be perfect. You don't have to be. Nobody has to be. God never wants anybody to be perfect because we all are work in progress. But is there any progress in that work? What God is trying to do, that's the question. We are work in progress, but how much progress has happened? That's the question. It depends on how much we are yielding to the Spirit of God. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, adultery, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like. Of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in time past, that those who practice such things will not in will not will not inherit the kingdom of God. Dear brothers and sisters, so here we see Paul says after giving the long list, Paul tra tell, tells us that it is not an exhaustive list. How do we know that? He says after telling envy, murderers, drunkenness, revelries in verse 21 and the like to show that this long list was only representative and not exhaustive. That's why Paul adds these words and such like and the like. The Apostle Paul here, basically he warned the Galatians as he had done when he was in their midst that those who live like this, who habitually indulge in these fleshly sins, who wants to be, who wants to, who makes sin a practice, will not inherit the future kingdom. Today, dear brothers and sisters, once again, this inheritance should bring us to another study which we a while back, we, as the Lord led, we talked over, we leave a, a link about our future inheritance and rewards. That's an astonishing study. That's something which we really want to keep our eyes on, dear brothers and sisters. Let's, let's take it in our jargon. If we were about to go to a trip, let's say to an unknown place, our table will be filled with brochures and information about, well, what is there? What, what happens this? We will be, won't be filled at least 15, 20 brochures, different kinds of things, information we will be having on our table. After rapture, when we go to heaven, how much information do we have? The Bible has a lot of information, dear brothers and sisters. Rapture is not the consummation of our every activity of a true born again believer. Rapture is the beginning. Rapture is the beginning. We are now in all. Messiah has placed us in boot camps. We are in training. That's why we are work in progress. We are in boot camp based on what Messiah has, based on how and where, what we are doing. Based on that, there will be inheritance and rewards and our placements because thousand years we are going to reign with Messiah. Revelation chapter 1, I believe verses 5 and 6, if I remember it properly, verses 5 and 6 tells us that we are made kings and priests. What does that mean? What does that mean? How does that make? How does what what does a king and what does that king and priest? How will it play out in the millennium and during the seven years of tribulation when we are in heaven and then when we come back? And of course, we hold the pre-trib rapture view, dear brothers and sisters. Hopefully, 
most of our dear fellow brethren you hold the same belief as we understand if not we still have we will leave a link to the dynamics of rapture and the time, doctrinal timing of rapture video please do take a look at it dear brothers and sisters pray over it so yes what happens exactly so inheritance and rewards is another study we cannot get into today we are once again running out of time dear brothers and sisters that's something which we really really highly implore you please do pray over we will leave a link to that our inheritance and future rewards please do please do take a look at it that could be the that could be the good starting point to understand exactly about our inheritance and rewards and then once from there let the spirit of god lead, guide you dear brothers and sisters since we are running out of time second corinthians as a matter of fact for 5 10 tells us about a bima seed judgment and what exactly happens there first corinthians chapter 3 verses 11 through 15 tells us about the wood hay and stubble and gold silver and precious stones that talks about our rewards as well then we all over the scriptures we see there are five about five different crowns being talked about so we will leave that link, dear brothers and sisters, the study of inheritance and rewards. Please do take a look at it. It was we shared in one of David's urgent word there. So please do take a look at it and let the spirit of God guide you. So today let's real quick, let's rush through the rest of the verses. So now comes after talking about the fruit of uh, works of the flesh now Paul comes but the fruit of the spirit is love joy peace long suffering kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self control against there against such there is no law against such there is no law dear brothers and sisters here once again that's the here is the key to understand the contrast between the works of the flesh versus the fruit of the spirit the word fruit is singular here it was works of the flesh and then we see fruit of the spirit the word fruit is singular why it indicates that these qualities love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control all these qualities all these all these qualities constitute a unity all of which should be found in a believer who lives under the control of the spirit second corinthians 3 18 philippians 1 21 is our authority dear brothers and sisters to understand that it is important one more thing as we are rushing once again one more thing it is important to observe that the fruit here fruit here described is not produced by the believer but by the holy spirit working through a true born again believer who is in vital union with Christ is the key to understand that we are not producing it. That's the key to understand, dear brothers and sisters, that we don't produce love. We don't produce any of these fruit we are talking about. It's singular telling fruit of the Spirit. We are not producing them. The key to understand, the key to understand that we are not producing it. It's we are bearing it. We are bearing the fruit. We don't produce the fruit. That's the key, dear brothers and sisters, to understand. If we don't understand, because we see this word fruit is singular, which indicates what? Indicating that these qualities constitute a unity. All of which should be found in a believer who walks, who lives under the control of the Spirit of God. When we try to produce love, that will be not a gap. That's a shallow love we are talking about, dear brothers and sisters. That's the key to understand. That's the key to understand. It is so important. It is so important to observe that the fruit here described is not produced by the believer, but by the Holy Spirit working through a true born again believer as the true born again believer is keeping on yielding to the Spirit of God who is in vital union with Christ. As a matter of fact, John chapter 15, there are three staggering discourses in the book of john there are three staggering discourses out of the others the three staggering discourses one we see is the upper room discourse john chapter 13 through 17 then we see the good shepherd discourses john chapter 10 then the vine and the branches discourses john chapter 15 verses 1 through 8 tells us that he is the wine we are the branches whoever abides in him bears much fruit without him we can do nothing so that's the key to understand that vital union the branch can only get nutrition when it is attached to the wine 
Hey brothers and sisters, have you ever seen a branch by itself producing fruit if it is not attached to the vine? That is where today we are struggling. We are talking about that we need to love our fellow brethren. We need to have joy in our lives. We need to have peace in our lives. All of these things. Paul says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, which is patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. We are trying to produce these things by ourselves. A study of the Greek words of all these fruit, which we are looking at all the nine fruit will be an astonishing today. We are running out of time to do that. It will be an astonishing study. It will be definitely rewarding dear brothers and sisters. But the key to understand is we are not producing them when we are trying to that we need to show love. Yes, we need to show love. But our first commandment is to love the Lord. Love thy Lord God Almighty with all thy heart, all your heart, all your mind, strength and soul. When we, when our vertical relationship with Him, when our vertical relationship with Him is aligned, He fills, God is love. He fills that agape, agape love. We are, there are four words in Greek. If we need to understand that it's agape. If we are not talking about filio, storge, or eros here, we are talking about agape, agape love, agape, which is God's love. Which is not based on any condition. That's the love we are talking about. When we love God with everything. When our vertical relationship. When it is aligned. Probably he fills us with his love. That love flows horizontally. And we can show love to others. That's where today we are struggling. We are not understanding. We are thinking why don't I have joy in my life. Because joy is a fruit of the spirit. And I am not attached to the wine. That's why I don't have joy. Why don't I have peace? Why, why am I not having patience to wait upon the Lord? The long-suffering patience. Why don't I have patience? Because I am not being attached to the wine. The branches, we are the branches. We need to be attached to the wine. Otherwise, how can we have joy and peace and the patience? We are talking about all the kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. None of these things we can produce, dear brothers and sisters. Trying to produce this is works. We cannot do it. It's laid out clearly in the scriptures. Works of the flesh versus spirit. Today we see lovelessness abound. Why does lovelessness abound? Because the branches are not abiding in the wine. The love is coming from God. A gappy love. That's why the end days will be marked. Matthew chapter 24 verses 11 and 12. End days will be marked with lovelessness will abound. People's love will grow cold for God and for each other. That's what we are looking at. Why? Because we are not attached to the vine. The society, our education system, our society, our everywhere, our workplace, everything is now streamlined in a way so that we they are trying to chop every connection chop every connection the branch is being detached from the wine in every possible way whether that is through the scientific world whether through the logical intellectual reasoning whatsoever it be but this is that's what is happening dear brothers and sisters we need to understand that i and you we cannot produce love we have to bear love a gap in which is Coming from God and God alone. It is the fruit of the Spirit. It's from God. It's from God and God alone. I cannot have any joy if I don't have joy in my life. The Bible says in His presence there is fullness of joy. So we are not in His presence. And secondly, joy is what is a fruit. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's not there means the branch is not attached to the wine. I don't have peace. I don't have patience today. I don't have kindness. I don't have goodness. Faithfulness. The world is happening like this. Because they are not attached. The branches are not attached to the wine. How about me? Am I attached to the wine? If I am attached to the wine, then it will show up. How? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, dear brothers and sisters. Let's not once again make it about perfection. Here we are talking about direction, direction. Lovelessness is the sign that the branch is detached from the wine. The true wine, Lord Jesus Christ. 
He is the true one. That's what Messiah says. So today, dear brothers and sisters, let's once again. Then Paul says, and those who are of Christ, in verse 24, and those who are of Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Those who are of Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Dear brothers and sisters, there couldn't be any clearer explanation to that. We talk about so many doctrines, so many different things. If I belong to Christ, if I belong to Christ, my life will be streamlined to please Him. I will have internal desires to please Him. The question is not about how much I could please Him today on a scale of 10. Let's see whether it's 9.29, 9.37 today. Oh, let's see. Oh, I need to get to that. I need to do an A plus grade on that. That's not what it is. It's about the intents of our hearts. That's what it is about. And God knows about it. We can play those games. We can fool ourselves, deceive ourselves because Satan is deceiving us when we give in the flesh. But God knows. And somewhere deep down in our heart, God is trying to talk to us. If he's talking to you today, please surrender, come to him. Life will be so glorious, dear brothers and sisters. This is not just from head knowledge. This is experiential knowledge. Yes, there are valleys. But in those valleys, Lord Jesus Christ is with us. And if God is for us, if God is with us, if God is for us, who can be against us? Yea, though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, but we will fear no evil. Why? Because Lord Jesus Christ, thou art with us, and thy rod and thy staff, they comfort us. Today is the day to come to him. Today is the day to stop, to say, no, I give up, Lord. I have wasted, I have wasted my life, but I give up. Lord, I may have surrendered my life, but I don't know. It looks like I have not completely surrendered from what I understand from this flesh and spirit talk. It looks like my life is totally in flesh. I surrender. And once again, dear brothers and sisters, it's not about condemning that who is living in flesh. It's about if you are and if you are a true born again believer, praise God. God will take care of that at his Sovereign time and sovereign will come to him, surrender to him, submit to him, turn it over to him. Please don't give him any solution. He will. He will do it. Come with the desire, Lord. Here I am. Here I am. As Isaiah said, send me. Here I am. Use me, Lord. All for you and your glory. Today is the day. Today is the day to commit our lives to Lord Jesus Christ from the crown of our head to the sole of our feet and say, here I am, Lord. Use me all for you and your glory. Help me, Lord, to give up on my flesh, to give up on me. Help me, Lord, transform me from inside out. How many of our days, how many of our, if it's hours or days, how many of our, how much of our time it is. Here I am, Lord. Send me, Lord. Use me, Lord. Mold me and make me, Lord, how you want. Today is the day, dear brothers and sisters, to come to him. Today is the day to acknowledge the fact that every true born again believer, this is true. Galatians chapter 5 verse 24. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Today is the day to crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. In us, we cannot do it. This is not a question of salvation. This is a question of the father. And his adopted sons and daughters. That's the question. Whether the adopted sons and daughters are going to willing to please him. Please our heavenly father. Do you want to do I want to please my heavenly father? It's not the question of salvation. It's the question of bringing pleasing my heavenly father. Glorifying him. It's the question of send me. Use me. Mold me, make me the way you want. May your precious blood, which you have saved me from my sins, which I was soaked in, whatever you have saved me unto, Lord, open it up, activate in my life. Here I am, Lord. 
and help me lord the scripture says and those who are christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires i am so inadequate i am so insufficient in of myself lord you know who i am you have the designer of the creator's manual here i am lord please 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 lord i surrender i surrender i surrender and paul says in verse 25 if we live in the spirit let us also walk in the spirit three important before we end today three important things paul is telling us galatians chapter 5 this is flesh versus spirit something which we really really need to dwell on for weeks and weeks and weeks and let the spirit of god open it up for you and me dear brothers and sisters none of us are perfect none of us will ever be perfect till we get our glorified bodies it's never the question of perfection here we are not talking about salvation and all the law versus grace here we're talking about flesh versus spirit the real battle it's a real battle for every true born again believer we open our eyes and we fight that battle flesh versus spirit it is more important for us to understand about flesh versus spirit than law versus grace because if we understand and please don't get us wrong it is so very important to understand about law versus grace which we keep talking but dear brothers and sisters it is more important and more fundamental to understand about flesh versus spirit because now that the question is for every true born again believer now that i am true born again believer saved by the precious blood of jesus christ of Nazareth, what do i do the first battle is flesh versus spirit. That's the fundamental battle. Today start learning dear brothers and sisters. Please do dig deeper. Romans chapter 8 is an astonishing, astonishing place to start with. As a matter of fact, first eight chapters of Romans, flesh versus spirit will tell us a lot about flesh versus spirit. A lot about salvation is by grace. Through faith alone, we will understand so much more. So much more. And then we have the book of Ephesians. Galatians, Ephesians, book of Romans. These three books. Dear brothers and sisters, please pray over to understand the soteriology. The salvation aspect of every single thing what we ever want to know. It will be there. But the more important battle today is flesh was the spirit for every single true born again believer. If the true born again believer is for the last 50 years, 60 years, 80 years, whatever, how many ever years? Or it is 8 hours. The battle is on flesh versus spirit. Three things Paul says. Verse Galatians 5.16. I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Galatians 5.18. Galatians 5.18. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Galatians 5.25 If we live in the spirit, let us walk in the spirit. Three things. Please take it to your prayer closet today, dear brothers and sisters. Once again, let us glorify our Heavenly Father. Lord Jesus Christ, return is upon us in these end moments. In these end moments, let us surrender ourselves. Let us once again, whatever opportunities Messiah is giving us, let us be faithful stewards. Let us surrender our flesh. Let us cry out to him, Lord, here I am struggling in the flesh. You know that you know, Lord, here I come. You help me. Scripture says that the Spirit of God will empower me to fight this battle. I am struggling, Lord. I am weak, but you are strong. You said that in my weaknesses I will be made strong. So I will boast all the more about my infirmities, about my weaknesses, about my struggles, about my valleys, about every single of my inadequacies. And insufficiencies. Here I am, Lord. Use me, mold me, make me. Here I am. I am yours from the crown of my head to the sole of my feet. Let us surrender our lives to Him completely, completely from the crown of our heads to the sole of our feet. We thank you, dear brothers and sisters. Lord Jesus Christ is indeed coming. What a glorious day He's bringing for you and me. One of these days, He is indeed going to call you and me. Come up hither. And let's end with a word of prayer. Shall we, Ella? Yes. All right, you can please go ahead. Lord Jesus, once again, I bring ourselves in your presence, Lord. And I thank you, Lord, for once again reminding us that you are coming soon, Lord. Help us, Lord, to walk in the Spirit, Lord, and to be in your presence at all times, Lord. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen and amen and amen. Once again, we thank you so much, dear brothers and sisters. And let us keep looking up. 
Lord Jesus Christ is indeed coming. Our redemption indeed draweth nigh. Let us keep up the faith. Let us fight this good fight of spirit versus flesh. That's the battle. Let us fight the good fight. And let us finish this race strong in the power of Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you everybody and God bless me. Lord Jesus Christ bless each and every one of you. Shalom.